Hello and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this 135th session of Miro II Talks webinar. This is Kapil Gautam Singh as your host for the today's session, and I'm also glad to have you all here today. Prior to the beginning of this session, I request you all to drop your queries that you have in between the session uh, to our chat box. We shall then discuss it on our next session, that is the discussion session, which is going to be conducted on the end of the webinar. For now, I'd like to move ahead to integrate the today's session. Uh, joining us today as a speaker and speaking delegates is Dr. Glenn T. Steele to share his insight on topic, just look retinoscopy procedure and uses. Before he begins, let me highlight his short introduction. Dr. Steele is an OD, FCOVD, and fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and also retired professor of pediatric optometry. Dr. Steele, I welcome you on our ITUX webinar on the behalf of Miro Eye Foundation and all our participants. Thank you so much for, uh, for your presence. So now it's over to you. You can please proceed. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I hope that uh, some of the things that I have to share uh, will be uh, beneficial to you every day in seeing your patients. We will start sharing the screen now. And now, good. So just look retinoscopy is a procedure that, that I have put together from uh, several different uh, colleagues over time. So nothing that I'm going to say is, is unique to me except just the organization. I have no financial disclosure, so I have nothing to sell. Uh, we always have to do that, so I want to make sure. But I do have other disclo disclosures. Everything I'll discuss is from the perspective of the processes of vision becoming the leader and instigator of action. If you just think about how much vision is involved in everything we do, and it becomes the leader, when compared to a person who is blind versus a person who is sighted, how much greater reach the sighted person has. It doesn't have anything to do with intelligence, but it's that reach and you can ev evaluate those processes from there. So vision is very powerful in everything we do in humans. And we've always been taught that eyes and brain, uh, eyes and vision are directly related to the brain. In reality, they're a part of the brain. We call them an extension of the brain. And if they're an extension of the brain, then they are a part of the brain. So when there's activity in the brain, there will be activity in the eye because activity in the brain when you stimulate a certain part they know through scans that a certain area lights up by the same token i contend when there's activity in the brain the retinoscopic reflex similarly brightens so those are the kind of things we're going to discuss today when we're touched we look to see where we're touched we don't just uh, go ahead and, and keep going and ignore the touch. When we hear a sound, we look to see the origin of the sound, but I wanna uh, expand one thing there. Think of the difference between hearing, just hearing the sound, and then listening. And in the same way, I wanna think about seeing and then looking. So looking is the kind of, of, of process that we want to assess. Where do the eyes of wine connoisseurs go when differentiating wine in the region, in the year? They start searching visually for those kinds of things. So a stimulus from anywhere may originate in any of the so-called senses, but then how we look to determine where it is, what it is, and how we're going to respond is what I'm going to be talking about. And all that happens in a split second. You'll see in one of the videos I have in just a second. So I want to repeat, everything I do is based on the premise that vision is the leader and instigator of overall development. And if it's a leader in overall development, then it's the leader in life. 
you think from crawling to running to walking to riding to driving to binocular function, uh, strabismus, amblyopia, refractive development. Every part of development has a support and direction through the processes of vision. So just look right now as a means of observing the parent's patterns of action when they're engaging in a task or their patterns of visual manipulation. And what do I mean by visual manipulation? We don't just look at something and see. We look, we focus, we, we refocus, we engage ourselves in that particular task. That's what visual manipulate, what I mean by visual manipulation. We make observations regardless of the age of the patient. Some of these things you say, well, in near retinoscopy, that's only good for kids. It's good for patients of any age um, uh, or the lens power that's there. Observations here are related to the patient's intentional actions and intentional attempts to engage in the task or the target that's presented. And it's a very simple test. You turn the retinoscope on, have the retinoscope, you turn it on, and you, um, you, you look through the peephole, and then you shine it in the patient's eye and you marvel at what happens there. So it's deceptively simple, but it's a test with many complex parts. Uh, it's such a simple procedure, yet they're all very complex. Our attention to the complexity emerges out of the choices we make every day when we're doing the procedure. So you can't expect to you remember back when you learned retinoscopy, how long did it take you to, to do learn to do retinoscopy the very first time? It took you a whole lab period. Now you do it in just a few seconds. So you can do the procedure, but then the complexity becomes uh, more available to you. And in fact, the more we look, the more we see. So don't think about it. Don't think you're going to take just look right now and look the first time and uh, well, I see something or I don't. You're going to have to look more. And then you get uh, children who don't develop the foundational abilities to look, attend, focus, identify, engage are typical for a that are typical for age are more vulnerable and susceptible to challenges and disruptions. So if they don't develop these foundations, and I call the foundations in vision. I want to look, I've got to attend, I've got to focus, I've got to identify and engage. Now, identify could be, oh, I've seen that before and I don't like it and I go away. But that, that's where the identification, it doesn't just come from first look. You have to do that. So it's important then to identify those at the earliest time and intervene at the earliest time because they will set the foundations for these babies as they're developing through life. One of the uh, programs that I've been involved in is called Infant C. And we see babies between six and 12 months of age during that first year of life to help them set those foundations, those visual foundations. And so my statement is it's a continuous observation over several seconds that creates the mental video of the changes in the reflexes. And this allows one to determine if there are possible times when the reflex moves towards better engagement or away from engagement. So think about that as you go through. Initial assessments with just look at us, we should just be done with no lenses in place. How is the patient operating? Because what I wanna see is not a refraction, it's not that kind of number. It's a number of, when I put lenses in front of the patient, what changes do I see in the retinoscopy reflex? And we'll have a video of some of those changes. And I use lenses as probes. Um, in, in her book, Coming to Our Senses, Susan Berry states that, as the philosopher Alvin Noé has written, perception is not something that happens to us or in us. It's something we do. And so I want to, you to consider that in, in your observations of retinoscopy. You're assessing how the patient is doing. And so if perception is something we do, then that intentional action can be observed with uh, just look retinoscopy. We're in observing the intentional action. She also quotes, we move our body, 
head and eyes to look and listen, to take in information about the world. We don't see until we look. So since we direct what we see, developing vision as an adult is an intensely active process. So what we're assessing with just look retinoscopy is that active process. A new pair of eyes won't lead to vision unless the owner of those new eyes pays attention to what he senses and figures out its meaning. Now, new eyes, we're talking about babies who are born, uh, but, but being a new eye, but they have to develop these foundations. Just like retinoscopy, we can determine how they're going about that, the active processes through just look retinoscopy. Arnold Dazelle, where I did my fellowship, um, before there was such a thing as optometric residencies, uh, said the retinoscope has revealed an intimate relationship between the functional com complex of the visual system and the maturity of the total action system. And that's uh, a paper he presented in 1949. I contend that that statement is just as true today as it was in 1949. One year later, he said in the Yale research, it was found the returning light in the young retina varied significantly in relation to identifiable moments of the visual act. The variation were manifest in motion, the direction, the speed, the brightness, and sometimes the color of the retinal reflex. Characteristically, he says, an increase of brightness in the reflex occurs at the moment when the infant identifies an object of interest. So again, I've got a, a video clip that, that's a very short 30 second video clip that shows so much of what uh, he is saying here. And then you might see a dulling as they search to identify and then brightening when once they do identify. So as they're looking and more intently and intently, you'll see that reflex dull down and then you'll see it brighten whenever they get there. And here's a short video. To, before we get the retinoscopy that, that um, I want us to use to set the stage. And this was done by Arnold Gazelle in 1950. Again, I take, I'm taking some of these things from many years ago, but again, because they're so applicable today. Pay attention to eyes and pay attention to how the baby is looking and then his comments. The eyes are pathfinders. The infant takes hold of the world with his eyes long before he takes hold with his hands. A one-inch cube reveals his eye-hand coordination at the age of four months. He moves his eyes selectively. He looks from cube to hand, and then back again from hand to cube. His eyes fasten upon the test object, and they maintain a firm grasp. The hands are activated even though they cannot, as yet, obey precisely. It is again evident that the eyes have a top priority in the scheme of development. He can reach with his eyes, but not with his hands. Yeah. What, what I want you to understand there, Gazelle was a pediatrician. Gazelle was not an optometrist. Gazelle was not an ophthalmologist. Gazelle was a pediatrician making these observations some 70, um, 80 years ago. Now, compare that to uh, an article by uh, Andy Melsoff on gaze following. And gaze following is if I'm the baby and you're the parent and I see you looking at a particular object that I will hold in my hand. If I see you looking there and I look there, I follow your gaze to that point, then if I do that at two, uh, he, he assessed that at 10 and a half months, two and a half years and four and a half years. And he showed higher gaze following scores at 10 and a half months produce significantly more mental state words at two and a half years. In other words, they knew more words at two and a half years. And with more mental state words at two and a half years, we're more successful on theory of mind battery at four and a half years. Those are some tests that I don't understand. But the important thing is here, he's using how the baby looks at a parent, a caregiver, a, a person doing testing, follows their gaze to where they're looking. And, and if they do that, by, the, by 
four and a half years, they are ahead of other people. These predictive longitudinal relationships remain significant after controlling for general language, maternal education, and non-social attention. So they, they took all of those other factors and, and, and ignored those, just looked at gaze following, and found it was significant. This was from 2015, connecting the dots from infancy to childhood. <clears throat> now, if performance at four and a half years uh, performance at four and a half years does have a foundation in gaze following at 10 and a half months. And a part of that looking can be observed with just look retinoscopy. So it's where they start looking and how they start looking. The processes of vision play a critical role in the very early start of all development and can be observed through just look retinoscopy. Now, he did one other thing. He said, he, again, looking at gaze following. When babies had active gaze following by 12 months of age, at, at 18 months of age, they understood 335 words. Now, babies will only say a few words at 18 months of age, but they understood and responded to 335 words if they had active gaze following. If they did not have active gaze following, they only understood 195 words. So vision is so critical and so foundational in all of development throughout. And this was from 2005, the development of gaze following. It's a predecessor to the, the um, previous article that we said. So vision is critical in all the development. Now here's an article I found from 2018. When your eyes move, so do your eardrums. If the eyes move to the right, my right, your left, whichever, the eardrums bulge left. And that happens 10 milliseconds before the eyes move, almost as if the brain is saying, ears get ready, the eyes are about to move. <clears throat> so it, it, this, this process of vision doesn't just happen in isolation. The process of hearing, of listening, the process of feeling and touch, doesn't happen in isolation, particularly in the younger ages. But you can follow that and you can assess that through that. It's not whether a child can complete a task or not that leads to success or lack of success. It's how they de develop their curiosity. And their curiosity to engage becomes so critical. It's more the effort that must go into the action required to complete the task. So if they have little curiosity, more effort's going to be required. If they have a lot of curiosity, they can move on from thing to thing and get that more depth. Where more effort is required, less action will be completed due to many of the following. In other words, if the child has to put more effort into the activity, there's going to be less action and engagement in completing it. leads to fatigue. It decreases the curiosity. It can relate to stress to complete any of the tasks. My games and video games are much easier, what kids will often say. They make mistakes related to effort because they're, they're focused so intently, they don't see the whole problem or the whole sentence or the whole word even. They get frustrated. It's just too much and it overwhelms them. And then they give up, not because they're not smart. It's just because this requires so much effort. But the assumption is, and they're probably told many times, I'm not smart. You're not smart. You're not working hard enough. When in fact, these kids are working. Finally, they just say, I'm not even going to, to, to play the game. I'm not even going to get initiate in the, in the, the activity. I'm not going to work on math. I'm not going to work on spelling and reading. It's too hard. I'm just not going to do it. So they can start and progress through without incident if is the way development starts. They can encounter obstacles and alter the process at any point. But then they have to get back to the traditional way of doing things, the expected way of doing things. However, if they run into problems, they can develop patterns and habits that redirect overall development. It's all a matter of how they develop patterns to engage in the tasks of life. And I think, uh, think of development as re revealed in the following. You see this, this puzzle with many pieces. If you consider this as a baby, the baby has to put themselves together from inside. 
they have to, through their own curiosity and developing foundations and exploration, they have to put themselves together. Now, we expect it to go very much like this. They're a little older now. They're a little older now. And then when they get to be a child, you expect them to be all put together. But what if they miss a piece or two along the way? And what if they, they develop these substitute pieces and substitute patterns that, that, that don't allow full and complete development for the culture? And all cultures are different um, and, and all households are different. So they approach it in different ways. But think of this pattern of putting the puzzle together. We think of a puzzle many times as externally we put the pieces together. But these babies put these pieces together internally, and the final puzzle is the way they have gone about it. So we can observe those and see those through retinoscopy. And if the reason we do retinoscopy is to arrive at a refraction, we then are limiting our own puzzle, our own ability to put pieces together of this patient. We limit the information available to us. It's sort of like a tweet. Uh, you, you, can, you can tweet very limited information because you only have a certain number of characters. And, and it's like so many uh, insurance plans in, in the U.S. and particularly in governmental plans everywhere. You've got to do so much information, but, but to be able to be profitable for you, you've got to do it in a hurry. And, and so you do less uh, testing to be able to see more patients. Um, but that, that's like the tweet. I want to give you... Uh, a, a little more involvement through uh, just look retinoscopy. You can access so many things in a short amount of time once you just get a little bit of experience because then your own curiosity takes over and you go into there. This video will provide an idea of what, what's available as a patient approaches a task. So I want you, as we go through this video, I want you to pay careful attention to all the things you see. Now, um, th this is my grandson, and, and what I'm having him do is just look at a target. You'll see, and we'll play this video. All right, Levi, touch that. Good. Now, again, touch it from straight up underneath. Good. Now, I want you to just look at that. No touching. And again, look at me. And now look at that again. No touching. Good. Now, what information could be added when you, uh, if you observe with a retinoscope, especially in that no touching part, but you can also add the touching part. Where are they looking and how are they looking when they come right up underneath the target? You see, the first time he sort of started out here uh, and, and went uh, on the, the, um, the Z axis away from him. Second time I asked him to come directly up underneath. Where is he looking and what's the accuracy of his look when you observe with the retinoscope? Now, this, this next video, pay attention also to several aspects of that and think what you expect. To set it up, we are, we are, I have my retinoscope and I am going, I'm, I'm t starting with a wand here with a ball to target. I'm moving that target towards them and watching the eye as we, um, as we move the target towards them. Open, open real wide, Nova. Nova. Target is moving forward. Now, did you see the, the, the pupil constrict as the, as the target was moving forward? That's something I'm not seeing as much anymore with these kids who are gamers. Let's go a little further. That was my pen. So, we'll, get a, we'll get a couple of cycles here. This is really hard. Yeah. we got to set it up on a table. Uh -huh. And it's back okay. at the plane of the retina scope. Now, look at the target, sweetheart. There wow. we go. And it's back okay. at the plane of the retina scope. Now look at the target, sweetheart. There. And it's back okay. at. Now pay attention to the increase in brightness, and that comes from a simple change in instructions. But 
but just imagine that that brightness is a reflection of what's going of attention that's happening in the brain. Now, I'm not a person who is a neuro person, but I know that those can, things can't happen in isolation. But while let's watch one more time the increase in brightness, the increase in attention that we can see. The plane of the retina scope. Now look at the target, sweetheart. There we go. Now. If you saw the pupil size change, you, you saw it move into against motion, which means they're following with accommodation. You saw a darkness of the reflex because that's a distance from the, the increased distance from the scope, but it's also an increase in the effort required to focus as they come in, an increase to sustain attention. And you saw that mark brightening the change that we saw. Remember, there were no instructions given at the very beginning. It's just we, I said the, the target is we're, we're moving the target towards the patient. It's when I said, now look at the target, sweetheart, that we got that instantaneous change. Now, what I want to see with, with uh, just look retinoscopy is if I put a lens such as this in front of a patient, this is a plus 50, this could be a plus one. If I put that in and I get that kind of instantaneous increase in brightness. That's a huge difference in what they say. So what do they all tell us? What would have been noticed if you're only trying to determine refraction? You would have had them continue to look and you would have paid attention to the motion, to the brightness, uh, not even the brightness. You just paid attention to the motion because your goal is trying to get to a number. Even with the autorefractor, what does an autorefractor give you? It doesn't give you those kinds of observations that you can make during that. It, it, it takes several different um, uh, measurements and then they, they average them into one single refractive measurement. I'm not saying an autumn refractor is a bad instrument. It just does what it does. It won't do more. And so with the retinoscope and your own observations, your intelligence, your um, uh, educational background, you can make those observations as they are happening. Now, I want to show you uh, one other one. You might want to dim the lights in your own room just a bit because the back, the, 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 the video I'm going to show you is, is rather dark. But this is CJ. He had a right exotropia at distance and near. We got 2080 in the right eye, 2020 in the left eye. Um, I'm not going to convert that to metric, but, but, but you can just see that the right eye doesn't see as well as the left eye does. And so here, there was no response to near testing. And here's the retinoscopy observation. Now, we're with my spot retinoscope, I'm able to see more than just a single eye. I'm begin to see both eyes at the same time. And you'll see that as we go through. I want to credit Dr. Paul Harris, who was helping me uh, on the original video and now helping me again on this video. Not quite. And you see as it comes over, you can see the you left eye clearly much see both brighter. Are very bright. I, I can see the left eye much brighter whenever we're doing that. Can't tell if I'm a little high or not. He's more so over, well to, over the to the left eye, eye now. Mm -hmm. But now you can right see eye is actually it's, relatively dull right now. Mm -hmm. And remember, the right eye is the exotropic eye, and you can see it very right unstable eye. in there in the way it's holding alignment. really bright still really bright okay look at it incredibly bright we had one of those white moments mm -hmm. oh, open real wide look at it now, now watch I'm, the I'm watch the pupil way. keep looking when i take my hand away keep looking right in there ready go watch the again. pupil we're going to do it one more time the watch the pupil space. size change You can see all the modulations that are going on in there. And now you see the pupil size change. So you see a difference in brightness between the eyes, but you see those modulations, especially in the right eye. And, and so you want those to, you, you want to have a fully illuminated pupil. 
you see a difference in configuration. What I mean by configuration, you, you, you just see that the right, left eye is more round than the right eye. And, and the, the, the right eye is just trying to, to work at focusing. And, and it's reached a point where it says, I'm not going to play anymore. And that's where the amblyopia comes in. But what concerns me is you got a marked pupil constriction when the cover is removed. So if you say, well, I'm going to patch the left eye, what, what level of curiosity is that child going to have? De developing the ability to focus almost happens by chance. And if they don't have a good internal curiosity to work at developing focus in that right eye, Patching is not going to be effective in this case. So you can learn those kinds of things from just observing with your retinoscope. And where was he focused when the left eye was covered? Certainly not on the target. Certainly not on the target. He was focused somewhere else. And when the left eye was uncovered, then he regained focus on the target. So, again, considerations for management, especially patching, this is one that you want to be very careful in doing any patching with. And here is his, his um, um, VEP, and you'll see the green there is with the both eyes together. The orange or yellow is with the left eye, and here's the right eye. Well, interestingly, both eyes together come down to the point of the right eye, the point of least resistance, rather than being able to come on up here. So it shows in the VEP, but you can do that much more quickly and much more efficiently, just watching with your, your retinoscope. Just look at everything as it happens. Consider this continuum from exploration to fixation and the quality of fixation. Consider the stability of the reflex. How stable is it whenever they're trying to focus? Consider the modulations. You're going to get these little variations as they try to focus in and, and really engage in the task. Um, but but it's, it's just um, you're, you're going from focus, uh, from uh, exploring, seeing everything out here until you find something you want to zero in on, and then everything changes. So eye movement simulations more show a single model of ocular motor behavior that can explain the saccadic continuum from exploration to fixation. We too often think of exploration and fixation just as, as, as two different things, but it's, two, it's the end of, an, of, a, a, of a spectrum. And the, you can go through a linear explanation here is, is exploration and here is fixation. Uh, so as you watch that, whether it's self-regulation, you can see how that child is really zeroing in on the target. And if they're exploring, they're not regulated or they're not, not uh, uh, really, really focused. Or at the other en end of that whole continuum, you have controlled and it's regulated. What happens if the child doesn't learn through the early development to come to this control state. How does that put them in uh, it, for things like reading? So development, it's consistently moving from one stream to the, one extreme to the other. And, and that's why babies will be walking along the floor and they'll see something on the floor that nobody else sees because we've already learned that. So if you have a persistence in any direction, such as we as adults, uh, I'm going to go on a little bit mother, further. But exploration is okay at two, but not at five. Why not at five? You need control because you've got to sit down in a classroom and sit still and control yourself and learn that self-regulated position. So where you want to see a child along this continuum depends on what the expectations are for the age. And so if, if their um, uh, terrible twos aren't called that for a reason, they're exploring everywhere and, and they don't want to sit down and focus. Um, Four-year-olds wander off because they see something, they see something else and they see something else. And then with parent in a store and all of a sudden parent has lost them because the child has just one, let their curiosity take them off. But when they start to school, they must now sit still and pay attention and do all of the things they need to do. 
the way they practice these patterns in early development comes the foundation. And, and we can see those foundations in uh, early development. For instance, Gazelle says, uh, these are four quotes from Arnold Gazelle, the child is born with visual hunger. In other words, they are always looking. The red is my, my comment on that. But the child is born with visual hunger. Seeing is not a separate, isolatable function. It's profoundly integrated with the total action system. What they look for, my, my comments again, what they look for is determined by their internal curiosity. So curiosity determines what they look for, what they look for, how they look for it, determines what we see in just look retinoscopy. Gazelle also says, to understand vision, we must know the child. And to understand the child, we must know the nature of his vision. And the, the last part is very, to understand this child, we must know how they're looking. You can get that through just look retinoscopy. And then, as he said in the video, the infant takes hold of the world with his eyes long before he takes hold with his hands. You can just remember that the child was almost anticipating, oh my goodness, I want that, but I haven't yet developed the ability to reach out and grab that. Young child, go, they go through the process of development. These patterns are just fragmented and variable, but later they become more stable and defined. And that doesn't happen just with growth and, de growth and development. That happens from the internal curiosity of what they do and how they go about doing it. If you limit how they do it, for instance, this wouldn't, I would suspect if, if this is the focused and controlled in, this patient might become, uh, this child might become my, more, have a greater tendency to become myopic because they have limited what they do. If, in fact, though, it was, lim it was uh, on the other end of, of the scale, they might become the athlete and have difficulty focusing in. Those are just two extremes, but we, we begin to call those patterns, habits, they, we call them diagnoses. And if we treat just the diagnosis rather than looking at the habit, rather than looking at the pattern and trying to change the pattern, then we're shortchanging the, the, the patient. So with retinoscopy, just look retinoscopy, you can observe these definable form patterns and you can be fragmented and variable or stable and defined in the manipulation. So what do I expect a child to show? I want to see them look. I want to see them attend. I want to see them focus. I want to see them identify and then engage in the target. Now think about all of those that you could do with just look retinoscopy. Look, are they pointing their eyes? Where's the Purkinje image? We see a lot of kids with dark eyes and dark pupils, of course, and it's really hard to tell precise alignment, but you can take your retinoscope and, and you can look and now you've got an illuminated background. And if you've got that illuminated background uh, of, of the light coming back, reflecting back, you can tell where the Purkinje image is. You can tell where they're pointing. Are they attending? Do they begin to focus on the target? Do, do they stay there? How many times during ocular motility did you have to tell the patient, keep looking at the target? Keep looking at the target. Well, now in retinas, we're going to know, are they just pointing their eyes at the target or are they really looking at the target and engaging in the target? So you can observe all of those kinds of things. Um, what if your eyes point to the target, but you see mark modulations in balance and brightness and motion and color? If you see those kinds of things, if, if they happen just for an instant and now they've got it and hold it, that's one thing. But if they continue that, that means you can pretty much be assured this is a child that's going to have difficulty in anything they have to do where they have to maintain focus. So it's also a developmental test. How prepared are they visually to do the activities that are going to be required of them every day? Are they fully ready to sustain and uh, 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 to look and sustain the process of looking um, on the, the object or the task? And we can do that through um, and just look at retinoscopy. So we want to make those observations as they approach the task while sitting in the chair. In other words, I pick up my retinoscope and I start looking before I say, and this will be a target that I use, before I say, now find an A on here, which would be one of the things that I would ask them to do. Find an A, find a B. And, and uh, I do have 
uh, letters missing so I can tell whether or not they're really fine. But I can already tell because I can tell by the way they focus and change focus. Refractive status is not static or stable. It's ever changing depending on the task and changes according to the task. That's why I'm not such a proponent of cycloplegic retinoscopy uh, in, in doing these kinds of things because it knocks out accommodation. Psychoplegia is used to eliminate those, those ever-changing motions and movements. I think that's very important as we watch that. We can observe when there are inappropriate modulations and in the presence of a less than ideal, I first look for a lens to move them towards this ideal. So how I do that, you'll see in the, the short video I have, but I'm holding these up and then I hold lenses in front of the patient as I watch and see what happens. So I want to make sure that I, um, I, I, I see those. Too often we just rush to the conclusion with our impatience and, and, and look at refraction. But by taking the time, we can get a mental video of what goes on in this, in this to make up this process of looking. And I say it's the continuous observation over several seconds that creates a mental video of the changes in the reflex. This allows one to determine if there are possible times where the reflex moves towards better engagement or away from the engagement with the task at hand. So are they further engaging and working to, or are they avoiding the task? So as you do it, use it more frequently, you, you, you come to respect and appreciate the dynamics of the system, and, and you become to appreciate more the value of the retinoscopic reflex. So use it to gain the ability to, to observe and do that. I don't start without the hyperopic presbyo. So these are my lenses. I use a double D seg. And if you look now, if you can see me in here, if, if I'm using my, my progressives here, if I want to see, I've got to put myself out of an upright posture just to be able to look through there. Whereas with these uh, double D seg lenses on, I can now hold myself in I uh, can't put them on too well. Now, I can hold myself in an upright posture and I can see um, uh, more clearly. So think about that as you do, particularly if you're a presbyo. These are all the things that I use and I carry most of the, 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 the um, testing materials around in a little fanny pack. I don't wear the fanny pack, but my retinoscope, my lenses, I use plus and minus two flippers a lot now. I've got targets for different age groups here, and, and then another set of flippers in there. But just again, start looking before the target is introduced. What does it take? And the child who immediately begins to look at the target is better set to, 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 be and get to engage than the child you have to tell them to look at the target. If I say find the A and I have to tell them now find the B, now find the C, and they don't pick up the, the speed of doing that, then they're not going to be as well. So what does it take to get them to look? Can they sustain it? You can watch. Are they, do they sustain their focus for a sufficient amount of time to go through the target? And I'm only going to be there 30 to 45 seconds in looking at that, and I'm asking them to find letters. And what happens when I get to the F, which is a missing letter on my target? Do, I, do they continue looking? Do they just say, yeah, there it is, which means they weren't looking at all? So how do they do that? Then I continue looking with my retinoscope after I remove, from the, the, uh, remove the target. Where do they look, and how do they keep looking? So there's this continuum from before they're aware of the target to the removal of the target and what's their pattern. And as they now look at the target task, compare left and right initially. You might see differences in right eye and left eye, but when you start putting lenses in front, and these are plus 50s, uh, plus ones, I can combine the front and the second for a plus 150. When I start comparing those, many times I will see this imbalance come to balance with equal lenses. So don't immediately jump to conclusions that there's going to be um, 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 an anisometropia there. Observe during eye movements. I observe many times when I'm doing eye movements here. Just look, how do they, do they 
uh, hold the balance and observe during alignment testing, observe pupil size. How do we best determine where they alone? Know the expectations. You know a five-year-old child is going to have to sit in a classroom. So what's the optimum where you want to be? Can we fully move them or partially move them? If we can fully move, if I get a change in brightness like we saw with Nova on that really big change, I know I'm going to get a good response with lenses. But if I get just a little response, I know I'm not going to get as good a response with lenses. And I may have to resort to things like vision therapy to do that. How long do they hold the optimum? It's better. So think of just look at NOSC being more of a, than a number. Think of this as a video you're taking and watch and listen as the patient responds. Look for information, how the patient is looking and the ease and effort. Now, these are my targets. And I always first a binocular procedure. Uh, this is for older kids. This is for younger kids, all, all who know their letters. Again, elf is missing here. Elf is missing here. But I, by looking at the uppercase letters or the capital letters or the lowercase letters, the small letters, you have a difference in an accommodative uh, response and expectation there. So look at that. And this is the way I would do that. And if I were seeing with motion here, the first thing I would do would be add lenses, a small amount, and then increase the lenses a little bit and push up until I get a consistent reversal of the motion. So think about the expected and watch accommodation with plus and minus two. I find this very important, especially in kids today who are doing an extreme amount of, of work on uh, and, and play on digital devices. It's very important. Watch accommodation as you do a push-up amp. Is it equal? And observe as you move the, either with them or look in particular meridians. So observe as, as you move with them as they look or even watch what happens when you put that lens in front. Watch what happens uh, as, as you uh, include, the, include that. Now, these are flippers I use. These are letter size I use. I expect maybe 12 cycles a minute for each school age set. Um, um, watch for a decrease in quality as you clear. And I want to get on to a couple of things here. This is the way I will do that. I'll show you a brief video. Target here, small I have letters. my target. And I'm doing plus two. Like this. Clear. Minus two, watching it in clear. Plus two, minus two, end. And I'm watching him clear. Now, what I did with with you do with a, a small group of kids that did not clear the plus and minus two, and when you compared that to the COVD quality of life checklist, it's 19 questions, and I found that 58 percent or 15 of them had over 25 which is a concern on this. Uh, a, a caution is had eight of them or 31%, uh, that would be between 20 and 25. Only three out of those that did not pass the plus and minus two facility um, had under 20, which is the expected. So 23 out of 26 or 89% of them did not pass uh, did not score well on the COVD checklist. So I use a plus and minus two where parents complain of intermittent eye turn and you don't see it because when I put the plus in front, I expect on, a, on an exotrope, I might see the eye turn out or with isotropy, I might see the eye turn in whenever I put the plus and minus twos in front. So there's so many different ways you can do that. So any deviation from alignment will indicate a fragile binocular system. So feel comfortable supporting the, the parent if you see this, even though you don't see it. It does take several instructions, does take several instructions to get them to look. And what happens if I keep adding plus and they push up to two plus 250? I tell my students who are rushing to get to dilation and psychoplegia, I said, if you get to dilation and you don't know where that patient is, uh, that, that they're going to, to blow up on you. In other words, they're going to increase significantly amount of plus. You haven't been paying attention as they go along.
So are the pupils larger? You get 10 millimeter pupils. Do they constrict when looking for smaller letters? You get alignment plus two and plus four regardless of motion. So I'm becoming very aware of these kids and, and I'm going to pretty much close it down here even though I've got some more. But I'm becoming very aware of kids with the large pupils who come in. And these are kids who are on game, uh, doing gamers. And I'm talking about a pupil like that. And you say, oh, that's a dilated pupil. No. And, and I used to see maybe one or two of these a semester. Now I'm seeing five or six a day. And I've linked it to the kids' use on digital devices. Now, before you say, well, they've got to learn those in school, I'm not talking about the time they use the digital devices in classroom or study or learning. I'm talking about the time they use it on social media and gaming. So what do you do on social media and gaming? You've got to be very aware of the periphery. If you focus on the periphery, you defocus central. If you defocus central, focus on the periphery, what happens to pupil size? Pupil size will get bigger. As you focus on central, pupil size gets smaller. So if you um, defocus, you're going to see a larger pupil size. If you defocus a lot during the day, these kids are up to 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning on their social media. Uh, it's like doing a VT procedure to defocus all day long. And so I'm seeing these persistently. They don't respond to accommodation. They do respond to, to, to pin line, but they don't respond to accommodation. So we're setting these kids up as parents by giving them devices to use to play games with. Because uh, how many times have you been in a store and, and in line and a baby is screaming and you say, oh, it's the baby would shut up. The parent pulls out a phone, a tablet, gives it to the baby, and they immediately calm down. Just think of that. So my method for prescribing it's from a developmental procedure perspective. How stable is it? Estimate the amount of movement. Add lens power till you get a good brightening. And then begin there. That's with high plus, high minus, high astigmatism. Only add lens power till you get to the first brightening. And that then lets the child take over in their own stages of development. If delayed they don't respond to lenses, initiate daily looking. Monitor frequently, follow up. How often do you see them for follow up? You don't prescribe the lens and say, we'll see you in a year. I want to see you in three months and maybe more often than that. And I may need to modify the power depending on how they've responded to those lenses. So think of just look as a view of the continuum from exploration to fixation, where they might be in their developmental process, are they able to self-regulate, to self-control focus at an age-appropriate level? And when they're at a specific stage of development, it'll show in retinoscopy if you'll just look. We all have been trained in a limited manner with a retinoscope. In other words, refraction, that's what it's for. Many people don't use it anymore because they have an autorefractor. It gives you so much information. Take it to another level. It's the continuous observation over several seconds that creates a mental video of the changes in the reflexes. This allows you to determine if there are possible times where the reflex moves towards better engagement or away from better engagement of the task at hand. And so I have several cases, but I know we're pretty close and we want to get on to some hour um, um, to, to some uh, questions and answers. Um, and I will go on and I will wish everyone a uh, happy and, and meaningful to Shane that begins Monday and goes on through September the, uh, the uh, to October the 8th. I also want to give you my email address. Uh, uh, feel free if you have questions to email me. Um, many times after a presentation like this, I, it's hard to get back to you, um, but, but feel free to, to email me. Um, get back to you simply because there's a number of people that have questions, and I try to answer all of them if I can. So I want to thank you very much, and now we will go back into any questions and answers that folks have. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Steele. So that's an indeed wonderful session with uh, unborn insight by the doctor is still. And I 
Personally, I feel the quality of light reflect from the retinoscopia that's reflecting from the passion eye is always mysterious and it's still many things to us. So I hope our audience today have got enough knowledge regarding dust loop retinoscopy procedure. Well, uh, now it's uh, time for a discussion session to begin. If you have any queries, then you can come up with your question on our chat box. So let me see if you have any questions. Maybe I guess the presentation is thoroughly nailed. I guess there is no question, even though if you have any question uh, from the retinoscopy, doctor is still more than happy to answer it here. Yeah. And the whole key is just start. Yeah. If, if, if. It's not magic. So we are waiting for one minute more. So let's see. I guess they don't have any questions actually. Doctor. <laughs> well, they, they can feel free to they can feel free to email me. Um, yeah. uh, in 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 doing uh, mm -hmm. and, and I will do my best to to answer in as timely a manner as possible. Yeah. Anyways, well, let, let, let me go back to one case here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Shit, nah, get out of the way. Share screen, and we'll go back here. And I, I want to go back to the these guys, Jalen and Jonathan. And and I want to what I want to do is they're four year old twins, and. Um, they, um, um, Jonathan was all over the room. I mean, a typical four-year-old, but Jalen just sat, sat in the chair. He wasn't watching, wasn't engaged. And, and of course, parent, both parents were with him and parents think, well, that's a, um, we just let them have their own personalities. And Jalen is just much more quiet. Um, he's not as much engaged as Jonathan. Jonathan's active and we try to slow him down or, or whatever. So what that, you know, what behaviors do you expect? You almost expect them where one is, the other one will be also. So just think about any twins that you know. And so Jonathan, his retinoscopic reflexes look just like that. But Jalen, the one that's sitting in the chair, look like this. And what we found with Jonathan was a plus 250, and with Jalen, he was a plus nine. So we've, what we found was we, we, we began to get that first brightening adding with plus fours with Jalen. We didn't prescribe anything with Jonathan because plus 250 is not that far out of bounds for a four-year-old. But we went with, after six months of wearing the plus fours, he comes in and through the plus fours, you can barely tell the difference between Jonathan and Jalen after that. So be very aware that, that this refractive difference you might see, you don't have to start with a full amount of refra refraction. We didn't even start with half of it. We started where that be first began to brighten. And then guess what? Now Jalen is all over the room, just like Jonathan. And fortunately, the parents recognize that that is a positive change rather than a negative change. So there, there are so many different um, um, patterns that you can see. And there's one other one. Um, anyway, uh, I'll... Um, We'll go from there. And I'm uh, stop the share. There we go. All right. 
Um, one other one. Um, Paul Harris had seen a patient who was, who was an accommodative esotrope. And with he had prescribed the year before plus fours with a two add. And with a plus four, he was straight at distance. With a plus six, two add, he was straight at near. That's good. The student was finding a diopter more plus and said, well, it's an esotrope. We probably need to do this. Well, I take my retinoscope and I'm watching when we have the plus six, he's perfectly aligned. We put the plus seven in front, which many would have done from psychoplegia, and he goes into an exotropia. And so you, it just look gives you an opportunity to see how is that patient going to respond and react to the lenses if you just look. Yeah. So, yes. Anyway. All right. So, doctor, I guess uh, our audience do not have any question. If they have, did they definitely mail to you? Uh, mail to you, and they yes. also can directly text to us, or they can also comment in our. Uh, YouTube channel, so maybe we can revert with you, uh, revert with the answer uh, in uh, future days. So once again, it's our immense pleasure to have you with us today, and uh, I, 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 I love to see you again in the future. So before wrap, uh, before wrap uping uh, today's session, if you have any good notes or if you want to share anything, uh, uh, it's a good notes to us, so uh, you can share, doctor. Well, just uh, again, for, for your uh, celebration of Deshane coming up, uh, then uh, I wish you all well. And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, it, it, it's my, always my pleasure to share because that's what I love to do. Um, I think we've already talked about um, uh, a brief uh, one on um, autism, so we can yes, yes. look for that yes. to, to come forward. Yes, so. yes, yes, yes. So I'm about to announce that we are also going to have yeah. a one more session on the autistic patient. So we definitely uh, schedule this uh, session very soon with the doctor still. So once again, happy to say to all of you here with, I announce uh, the close of today webinar, hope, hoping to see you all again on the next session with the doctor still. So stay safe, stay connected. Thank you so much.